Dear participants, welcome to the Delphi D webinar on morphological modeling of the riverine branches. We will start with a presentation by Mohamed Yosef. At Deltares, Mohamed Yosef is an experienced river engineer who worked in many river projects in Europe, Africa, South America and Asia. He is one of the experts behind the development of the morphological model of the Rhine branches in the Netherlands. The presentation will take about 40 minutes. During this presentation you can ask questions via the chat box. We will try to answer your questions immediately. After the presentation, you are kindly invited to ask questions by speech. I now give the floor to Mohamed Yosef. Thank you, Eric. Uh, good morning to uh, the people in the West. Good evening to those in the East. And good afternoon to, uh, to those in the uh, central part of uh, the world. Uh, I would like to, before starting my presentation, to say that this work is uh, a very large teamwork and I'm here on behalf of several people in, in Deltares. I'm going to take you through uh, a, a few years of development uh, behind the building and the using of the morphological model of the Rhine branches in the Netherlands. And I will try to be, uh, in some parts, going through some details in order to explain a bit the, 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 the background of some choices and in some other parts I may go a bit fast. So uh, uh, please uh, feel free to ask uh, 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 using the chat box. So the, in fact the, the, the Rhine branches or the Rhine River uh, in Europe is, is uh, considered the backbone of the Northwestern European uh, uh, inland water transport network so it's extremely important for navigation and there are continuous efforts to keep uh, the river or the navigation channel navigable. It is the connection between the port of Rotterdam and the, uh, and the hinterland in Germany, so the, the industrial part, and there is a lot of need to, uh, to keep it maintained by dredging or continuous uh, uh, river engineering measures. Uh, after several discussions and after several uh, attempts to keep the, uh, the, uh, uh, the river uh, uh, navigable, the, the, the uh, Rijkwaterstaat or the, the, the Water Authority in the Netherlands realized that there, need, there is a need for a tool that is uh, capable of uh, analyzing historical trends, uh, predicting future trends and also evaluating the different measures. And we came to the conclusion together that a numerical model that needs to be built and this model in, in the in, 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 uh, needs to be both accurate but also fast. And I will come to this why fast in, in, in uh, in, uh, in, uh, during my presentation. So the DVR, we call it here in the Netherlands, it's, it's uh, symbolizing a sustainable navigation channel for the Rhine branches. Uh, the, 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 the target is to maintain the navigability in principle and it is built in discussion with the river managers in the Netherlands. So that is uh, part, of my part of my presentation. I would be also explaining a bit on the discussions on choices. Uh, the outline of today's presentation, I, I will take you through the, uh, the construction of the model, the calibration of the model and some applications of the model and in the construction we will look at some components like the grid, the schematization, how do we do time management, uh, what do we do for dredging activities which is uh, extremely important in, uh, in, the, in, uh, in the Rhine and for the calibration I will take you through the hydrodynamics morphology as well as how did we calibrate uh, for dredging activities. This, is, this might be a non-trivial part of the presentation. And for the application, I will, I will show you some uh, three cases uh, ranging from uh, in, uh, 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 river engineering measures, so this longitudinal and dams, and the maintenance uh, two measures. One of them is dredging and the other is nourishment. To start with, there was uh, before 2005, some attempts to, uh, to build models on an ad hoc basis to evaluate certain components or certain questions, uh, but around the, the, the 2004, there, there started to be a realization that perhaps we should have a unified model that, that we can use in all our studies uh, when it comes to the Rhine, and in 2005, we started with this model construction. Uh, and uh, very quickly after the initial phase when we uh, calibrated the model and improved the speed, uh, we started to use it in, uh, in, uh, in some applications. So here the model has been operational already in 2008 and then uh, improvements and extension to the model took place and uh, to add all branches, to add more details in the hydrograph for example and uh, in uh, a couple of years ago we started to also increase the processes by adding a graded sediment uh, functionality 
And starting this year and hopefully next year, we are migrating from the old or the, the, the existing uh, structured grid Delft 3D4 to the new flexible mesh Delft 3D, uh, 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 which has been uh, released last year and uh, continuously being uh, uh, improved as we speak. Uh, for the model construction, the background picture is uh, a typical part of the Rhine in the Netherlands. It, it, it can be uh, uh, clearly seen that there is uh, a lot of uh, uh, groins. There are 500 of them, for example, in the Waal River. Uh, there is a floodplain, which is uh, uh, not only vegetation, but also uh, including some uh, 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 locked water bodies and a navigation channel that is very regulated. And you can see also uh, ships. We do not model ships in this model. We started with the uh, the construction uh, by this first part, so the uh, the, uh, the the upper part of the, uh, the 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 Rhine and the main branch, which is the Waal, which is connecting Rotterdam to Germany, and we continue to extend the model in the downstream part with the, the estuary of the the Rhine uh, to the North Sea, and we added the ISIL and then followed by the Niederrhine. In general, we have nearly 360, uh, even more. Uh, kilometers in, in, in rivers to model. Uh, sometimes we use the model in, in its entirety and sometimes we split it in, in order to have a bit faster uh, simulations, but uh, for many studies we use it uh, uh, in a complete, uh, in, as a complete model. We did use uh, what we call domain decomposition to build the model, uh, specifically for uh, bifurcations. As you see, uh, this is a picture of the entire model showing some bifurcations. And uh, uh, for example, here we start with the, the first bifurcation, the Panasa Kop, splitting into two branches, the Waal and the Panasa Canal. And here we have also a refinement. So we start from a 10 grid cell in the cross section of the main channel to 12 grid cells in the Waal and 8 grid cells in the uh, uh, Panasa Canal, which is a lot narrower. We have a kind of a rule of thumb that uh, a cross section of a river should not be represented by eight grid cells. We think this is the minimum number of grid cells that's sufficient to have a proper cross-section profile to include the transfer slope. You may argue that you may need a lot of finer details uh, in order to have a lot of features, but uh, you have to realize the finer the model it is, the, 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 the smaller the time step, and then the slower it is, uh, and then it becomes maybe non-operational or non, uh, not, not easily usable. So we came to this uh, after several years of, let's say, experience on, on two-dimensional modeling. Uh, a coarser model than this, maybe you should think then in terms of 1D, and then you lose a lot of details in the cross-section profile. Uh, this is the second bifurcation where uh, the Panasa Canal splits also to two canals, to two branches. And here you see four grid cells splitting into eight in the main channel. I'm not counting the number of grid cells on the floodplain, but uh, I'll show an overview of how many. And for purposes of, uh, let's say, speed at the beginning of the modeling of the model, we, we decided to split one of the branches into, in fact, three parts. And here we see a one-to-one -one coupling on the, on the boundary. I just show you an example of, of the meaning on, or, or the tests that we did at the beginning to, uh, to, uh, uh, to choose the grid. Because, in fact, when, when you build the model from scratch, you do not start with a known a resolution that's sufficient. So here it's a part of the river which has some uh, 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 a secondary channel and then how does this connection appear and here you see an example of a fine grid, a bit coarser grid and a slightly different grid and you can see the, the difference in discharge when you change the grid. So it's up to you to start to realize what kind of resolution do I need or what kind of resolution is sufficient to represent the features that I want. For example, you do not want to miss a secondary channel like this in your model. So after we chose the, 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 the final grid, I just want to show you uh, some of the typical dimensions that we have in terms of width and uh, length of the uh, uh, grid cell. Uh, again, for, for rivers, we know very well the flow direction, so it allows us to optimize the grid by having a bit of a, a rectangular uh, grid, especially for uh, uh, when it's a curvilinear grid, in the streamwise direction. We need a high resolution in the cross direction, so that's why we have around the 20, 20 uh, below 25 uh, uh, meter grid in the cross section, and we always want to keep 
the aspect ratio of a single grid cell below 4. And so we end up with an 80 meter in the longitudinal direction. <coughs> After you have a grid, now the second step, in fact, is to project your uh, geometrical features or topographic features on this grid. And here we have a very uh, extensive uh, database uh, storing all the river features, whether it's uh, bathymetry or uh, vegetation or structures, in in uh, in in a GIS format. And even we have uh, a dedicated add-on uh, in in ArcView that 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 manages this database. We call it baseline. And uh, this is ba based on this. We project all the features on the grid. You do not need to have a, 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 an add-on in ArcView to do this. You can do it directly using the user interface of uh, of Delft 3D, the the the, the, the pre-processing part, by projecting this on the grid. So we have projected the bed topography uh, uh, roughnesses coming from from alluvial part of the channel and the uh, and the floodplain vegetations. We put structures, whether it's a barrier or a groin or a dike uh, or steep obstacles. And this is just for reference. We used an initial topography of 1997 and updated it with the multi-beam measurements of 1999. This is the oldest multi-beam measurements that we have, and we wanted to have the oldest multi-beam measurements in order to allow our model to simulate a period which is well monitored. So we, we look at how does the river uh, change in the model and in uh, 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 the measurements or based on measurements. And after we have constructed the model, we added uh, the non-erodible layers because there are few of them in the Rhine to maintain the navigation, and this is simply an area without sediment to be eroded, so it's, it's, it acts like uh, a fixed bed. Uh, afterwards, then we start to uh, uh, implement roughness. Uh, I will start with the floodplain roughness because, in 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 the case of the uh, uh, of this model, the floodplain roughness is fully based on vegetation coverage with analytical representation uh, 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 to calculate these roughnesses, and. Uh, this comes directly from the GIS database. Afterwards, the, the main channel roughness, we base it on alluvial roughness, and it is, after, it, we, after we, uh, provide the first set, it is subject to calibration. But, uh, so, and I will come to this in the, in the, in the calibration of the hydraulic model. And then, uh, just to note that it is specified per river reach, and the reach is simply between two measurement stations and it varies in the longitudinal direction and it is uh, sometimes uh, can change but we try to avoid sharp transitions in roughness and I'll come to this again. That is a typical picture of the projected structures on the model so mostly you see a lot of uh, uh, these lines on the grid, these are weirs and these are subgrid weirs to represent these obstacles and uh, uh, they have a crest level and some uh, 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 characteristics of a weir like the the uh, discharge coefficient, so which which is used to be to, as a calibration coefficient as well. So such a model is, is 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 relatively complicated to run, and it would consume a lot of time if we are not uh, managing the time cleverly. And then uh, in, in this part of the presentation, I would like to show you how do we do this. And it is composed of two components. The first one is. Uh, schematizing the, the, the hydrograph and the second one is what we call a simulation management tool. So, uh, uh, in order to simulate the, the a, a typical year, you can simply use uh, a full-time series uh, coming from the measurements, but this would be very expensive in terms of commutation. What we do is we try to schematize this into uh, uh, representative discharges, and we do this based on statistical analysis for a very long time series. So uh, the time series is converted into a probability density function in this case, and then converted into a cumulative density function, and then sorted in uh, steps. So the black uh, uh, staircase here are the steps. Uh, that represent a proper hydrograph, but this is not the hydrograph. The hydrograph is uh, in step four, where in fact it has a shape that is also based on the time series itself. And in this case, you you can have uh, a stepwise uh, steady state discharges run uh, 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 in a sequence to represent a quasi steady uh, simulation, and this allows. Uh, uh, acceleration of time based on a morphological acceleration factor. So, 
the principal idea here is that the bit form celerity is way slower than the the uh, the celerities in velocities, and then you can accelerate the morphological process by a multiplication. And in this case, we we use a, a, a factor that can range from 50 to 200, and sometimes can even go more than 200. And this factor is in fact uh, uh, inversely proportional with the sediment transport, and and hence with the discharge itself. And then you end up you start with a morphological time, so that's a typical. A hydrograph that you want to simulate, again it's split into a representative discharges and for the hydrodynamic time you end up by dividing by this morphological factor so you get a, a much shorter duration to simulate. So that is the principal idea behind this uh, uh, morphological acceleration factor and then uh, uh, if you use a quasi steady discharge or a stepwise discharge it is very easily uh, 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 done. The Management of time, in fact, or how do we manage uh, a complicated simulation like this? So here we have a, a, a Python-based uh, uh, tool that allows us to, uh, let's say, store in a database uh, the hydrodynamic information and update information as we go. So I will try to go through slowly the first simulation you, you start. You start from scratch, and then you start building up your hydrodynamic database and then there is an information about a certain uh, discharge what is the, the, the correct hydrodynamic uh, result for this and then at the end you end up with a morphological simulation that is uh, producing bed level changes and this uh, you combine the bed level changes with the hydrodynamic simulation uh, 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 using the, the let's say if you have simulated the first discharge, you end up with uh, a morphology uh, result, and this morphology result is fed into a restart file, and the hydrodynamic result is coming from the database, and then you have a new restart file for the next simulation, and it goes on like that. And in this way, we can really run a very long time series in a manageable time. The other component that I wanted to talk about in the model construction part is the, uh, the, the dredging module. And in fact, when we started, we had a basic dredging module uh, in Delft 3D. And then based on discussions with the river managers and how do we do the dredging and what are the, 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 the rules and what is the, uh, the contractual uh, obligations on uh, uh, dredgers to maintain the river, we needed to add a lot of functionalities. And I will tr try to describe a bit on, on these functionalities as we go. So in fact, the, the river is, is, is split into, uh, uh, let's say, defined uh, 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 sections. Each section of them is one kilometer. So we needed to be able to define dredging inside uh, arbitrary number of polygons. And these polygons can be small, can be big. It's up to the user, of course, to decide. And this comes from the description that comes in the Reichwasserstadt relation with the dredgers, in fact. And it has to be flexible and the dumping because dredging, uh, because of the 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 typical uh, degradation process in the Rhine, uh, dredged material is not allowed to be taken out of the river. So it has to be dumped back to the river, and it has to be dumped in deep places. So again, as you see the picture, this uh, dredged block is dumped in this block and in that block based on the depth. And we have some dredging, what we call dredging criteria, that is uh, when that, that decides when to dredge, so how do you trigger a dredging operation, and we have two uh, 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 general uh, parts. One of them is uh, you specify directly the level above which you start dredging, that is method A, or you specify uh, a reference from or a, or a certain uh, a depth below a certain reference level and then when you start dredging and here we have in both cases we have what we call a clearance. So if you are supposed to dredge to a two and a half meter depth you should use uh, uh, option B and then you do not want to have it exactly at 2.5 meters but you want to add a certain margin like half a meter extra dredging. So that is how do you dredge or when do you trigger dredging. And the other one is how do you do exactly the operation of dredging. So in this case, I show how do you do the dredging. In fact, we have three options. One of them is simply dredge the top part. And the second is to dredge it in proportion to the depth. And the third is to dredge with a constant uh, thickness. And if you do this, you need also to describe how do you want to dump your material. And we have two big uh, or two distinct uh, uh, ways to dump the material. And whether you dump 
the first, the D part first, or you dump it in a in a in a in a uniform way. In fact, in 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 our model, we use uh, case A and A in both cases. So dredge the top parts and dump it in the D parts. And there are also additional constraints like time uh, or the minimum time between two dredging operations, as well as the maximum capacity of dredgers that you can use. And all of these can be specified to the model. Uh, I will come a bit more to the dredging and the calibration of the dredging module. So after the model has been constructed, the needed functionality was added and implemented. We started with the model calibration. And we typically start with the hydrodynamic calibration. And one of the typical questions, of course, when you do morphology is which sediment transport formula do you want to use? And this is subject, of course, to your knowledge of the river and your knowledge of the behavior of the river and perhaps uh, an analysis of the available sediment transport formula that, that represented, represent the, tip, the transport capacity in, in, in your river uh, properly. And after you choose a, uh, the transport formula, you start with the morphological calibration. And then in, in the Ryan case, we have an additional step, which we call calibration for the dredging activities. We want to be able to predict correctly the dredged volumes, the yearly dredged volumes that has been done before. For the hydraulic calibration, I don't want to go to full details of, of, of really what did we do. But just to cut it to the, the, the most important components is uh, uh, in, in a typical hydrodynamic calibration are, in fact, three parts, the water level, the discharge distribution and the velocity cross sections. For such a large rivers, it is not uh, 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 common that you have a lot of velocity measurements, and it comes down to water levels and discharges. And that's what we have in our model. And we want to get the discharge distribution between branches correct, and we want to get the water levels correct. And just to give you a, a quick tip on how does this happen. So in fact, the first step is we split the model into branches, so we treat each individual branch separately, and we provide as an upstream boundary condition to each branch the discharge that we think correct for this branch, the correct, so the correct percentage. And you start calibrating the water level of this branch, and then we start from the downstream part of the model, and we move upstream. And for each station, you can have a, a reach that has different roughness from the one uh, 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 in the upstream. So that's how you do it. And then you would end up having a correct water level at the upstream of your branch. And you do this for the second branch. And once you glue them together with the upstream, most of the time the, 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 the resulting discharge distribution is correct. Don't, uh, don't, don't be surprised uh, uh, if you find it happening. But in some rare cases, it doesn't happen. And then you have to really model the, or calibrate uh, in a second step, uh, the, the, the bifurcation uh, in, 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 uh, together. And that is a typical result from, uh, from the, uh, the, uh, the, the model at low water levels. And the target is, of course, to match the measured water level with the calculated water level. And here we show the result of the calculation. Uh, the first one is based on no limitations on the roughness. And the second one is putting a lower limitation on the roughness that it shouldn't be uh, uh, less than three times D90. So you're not allowed to go finer than that. And we needed to put this limitation because the downstream part, uh, we had some uh, trouble calibrating it with a typical roughness. And we found that it needed to go way smoother than this. So we put this limit. And in fact, in, in, in the downstream parts of rivers and estuaries, when the slope is very small, the roughness effect is very uh, minimal. Uh, 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 and doesn't have that much impact. The geometry plays more more uh, more role in here. For the transport formula, in fact, we knew that we needed some uh, criteria for our transport formula for this river. So we know that the upper part of the river have a behavior looks like a Meyer Peter Müller formula. That's the, what I call MPM here. We know that the lower part has an England Hansen type of formula. So what a total sediment transport fine material, so that's the lower part. And for physical reasons, we needed to have certain limitations on the power of this uh, transport formula. So in a formula, in a formula that takes the sediment transport rate is a function of the velocity to a certain power. We we wanted to have this power always larger than three and in the order of four to five. So what we did, in fact, we started to uh, having these formulas. So the England Hansen, which is preferred for the lower part the Meyer-Peter formula, preferred for the upper part. And then we uh, we tested a combination of this formula. So th this combination is, is, is simply 
uh, adding or multiplying England Hansen by Maya Peter uh, with Maya Peter uh, Muller uh, formula, and we also tested the Van Ryn. So if you can write these in in one line, unfortunately Van Ryn doesn't fit on the screen. So I just give you a screenshot of uh, of the Van Ryn formula, 1984. <coughs> Sorry. And what we did is we tested how the performance of these formula for a certain range of uh, the, the mobility parameter uh, or the shields parameter which is which we are interested in and we looked at how do they, uh, they, they, they compare to each other and we also looked at the degree of nonlinearity and based on this we come to the conclusion that we would like or we, we, we use we will use the formula of uh, Van Ryan 1984 uh, uh, with with an additional implementation in Delft 3D that allows calibration of the 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 the, uh, the bed load transport separately from the, the suspended load transport, and we also wanted to speed up the simulation by adding both the, both the suspended load to the bed load in in a total load, and this is using uh, uh, if you use the option bed load, it will directly uh, uh, move from a split uh, uh, two loads into a total load. And we also wanted to have the critical shields parameter uh, in the formula as a calibration coefficient. So these are these were in fact additional implementation in in uh, in the 3D specifically for this project. And the the after you have chosen your sediment transport formula, then there are two parts of the morphological calibration. The first part is the 1D behavior, and the second is the 2D behavior. We take it one step at a time. We start with the 1D behavior. The 1D behavior, I would like to attract your attention to the lowest part, uh, uh, requires, in fact, hundreds of offline calculations. So, in fact, this is based on analysis of uh, 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 hydrodynamic results and uh, plugging into the hydrodynamic results, the sediment transport formula, and calculating the transport gradients. And after hundreds of simulations, which is really very quick, I mean, you can do this in, 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 in a couple of days, you reach at your initial settings. And then using tenth of uh, 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 proper calculations, you use that your final set. And here, <clears throat> what do we look at in a, in a one-dimensional behavior? In fact, we look at cross-sectional average uh, values, whether it is the uh, starts with the sediment transport load, and bed form celerity, uh, the, the, the bed level changes, and changes in slope. And here we decided that the, the bed form celerity is one of the most important parameters, in fact, the most important parameter in our case, because we want to model and, and, and correctly uh, evaluate behavior of engineering measures that propagate in the downstream direction, and dredging is important. So the reoccurrence of dredging, in fact, is based on how fast features move in the river. So that is why uh, we have this as, as highlighted as red. And we have a couple of parameters that allows us to calibrate. So in fact, the alpha, which is the, the, uh, the calibration coefficient that goes directly into the sediment transport formula. And here we said we have two of them, for the, one for the bed load, one for the suspended load. And then the critical sheets parameter. And, and if these are not sufficient, then you have uh, a D50 that you can uh, manipulate to meet your uh, uh, last uh, demands. Moving to the 2D behavior, it is a bit more complicated than the, than the 1D behavior. And in this, we focus on getting the transfer slope in bends correctly and the position of the crossing. I will, I will, this is the, the in fact, the, you want to get the power pool pattern correctly. So the, pro, the, the location of the crossings between two bends should also be correct. And here, it is based on uh, a tenth of simulations. So you cannot do this offline, unfortunately, but you need several simulations to get it right. Uh, and here the, the parameters that, that you are you can use are in this uh, 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 box, so uh, the, the, the coefficients that affect the spiral flow motion and the coefficient that influences the transverse bit slope. Uh, I didn't mention that that, in fact, uh, when I said a quasi 3D model, I meant a 2D uh, model with a parameterization of the spiral flow motion uh, that describes the transverse velocity profile. Uh, if you have more questions about this, I can answer it later, but uh, I'll keep it here uh, at this. And after this, we, we, we know that there is, in the upstream, we needed an additional morphological boundary condition 
and in this case we know the rate of degradation of the uh, the, the the upstream section of our model and this is uh, uh, we can use as a prescribed bid level change uh, as upstream boundary there are several other uh, uh, boundary conditions that can be used. I just want to say that uh, option two, which is a fixed bid level, is the default value. You may uh, uh, want to use it. Uh, you may decide to use something else, but uh, in this case, we use a prescribed bid level change at the upstream boundary. The calibration results in, in, in 1D, we looked at the sediment transport, uh, let's say, uh, annually, the sediment transport load. And we, we come up with values that are very well in the, in the same range as expected. So for the bovine, we are a bit below than, than, is, than measured, but I will come to this uh, uh, in a second. In, in the main branch, the wall, we are uh, 410 compared to something in the order of 300 to 400. So we were very happy with that. And here we are in the order of 100 uh, 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 a thousand meter cubes per, per year compared to something in the order of 70 to 100. So we were very happy with that. Here there are some deviations and we think that there are some uncertainties in, in the measurements uh, uh, that, that, that we can safely assume that uh, we are uh, uh, having a proper sediment transport load. And here the bedform celerity in, in a very uh, uh, aggregated way, so per branch, uh, uh, and we see the measure, the black, and they calculated the gray. We have a very good match. And uh, other quantities like the average yearly bid level or the, the, the slope are also well. I want to discuss a bit more about what we did for the, the bid form celerity. As I indicated, this, this is the, uh, the highest importance. So what we did is we added uh, three trenches in the model at three different locations. And we wanted to see how does these trench migrate. We know from the measurements that uh, an expected one kilometer per year is uh, 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 roughly a correct value. And we look here in this in a bit more detail on how do they behave. So the trench in the upstream of the river is a bit slower than one kilometer, but it is in the order of, let's say, uh, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 uh, uh, kilometers per year. And the one in the middle is uh, nearly a perfect match at a one kilometer per year, and also the one in the downstream is 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 accurately reproduced. That is that gives us very high confidence in uh, in the performance of let's say the one D behavior of the model. And I, I want to uh, to iterate. These are cross sectionally average quantities, so they are not one D. It's cross sectionally average from a two D result. In a two D calibration, so that's the typical uh, uh, longitudinal profile that goes through the left bank and through the right bank, and then you can see. Uh, the shallow part uh, of a bar and the deep part of uh, of a pool. So, and, and the distance between these define the cross, uh, the cross or the transverse uh, slope in a cross section. And the locations of the crossings are important to reproduce. So, in this case, we have the 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 measurements are in different color uh, dots, and the calculations are in 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 uh, in uh, in blue. And this, you can see a good match between the calculated and measured uh, quantities. So this also gives us very high confidence in, in the model. The last piece of calibration is, in fact, related to the dredging. And for the dredging, uh, uh, there are two components that contribute to the dredging. The first one is the shallow bars that are uh, localized at, at, at char bends or at bends in general. And the second part is the, the dune heights. So the higher the dune, the more dredging will happen. And here we have uh, an overview of a measurement uh, uh, through the year of 19, uh, 2002. So this is measuring all the, uh, the dune heights. And in, in uh, the river flows from the right to the left in this case. And then we are focusing at, 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 at a snapshot coming from days, uh, let's say, days uh, 150 to 200, and here we see the model result. And we see that in the upstream, it is a bit low. In the downstream, it's a bit high. And this also matches the, the, the measurements. And in, in, in this case, we use uh, the dune height predictor of Fretzo uh, based on my Peter Muller. And here are the typical settings that we used in this case. The second part of the dredging, in fact, is where do you dredge and how do you dredge and when do you dump and what is the, 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 the settings of the, the dredging. So in this case, we, 
we define the dredging in polygons. So this is a very long file describing all these dredging polygons. In fact, every kilometer we have one dredging block and we have a different dumping block. So this is a very long file, this dredge150b.pol, pol is polygon. And the other uh, uh, parameters in here, so this is the depth, this is the clearance, this is the minimum dump, uh, the, the dump location, this is how you include dunes, and this is the, the distribution of dredging. So I described these before, these are the typical settings, and here we have a comparison between the calculated and measured dredging, and we are really happy with this type of result, because dredging is one of the most complex uh, features to, to predict in a model, and we, hear, we have a comparison between calculated and measured, and we see that we are reproducing it in a, in a very fair way. So, after you have calibrated your model, these are typical results coming from the model. We have a, a, a 1D behavior that can be uh, shown in a cross-sectional average. Uh, uh, longitudinal profile, you have 2D behavior that can look in a 2D map, and this is these are two representative uh, results, and we have a dune height uh, uh, that goes, uh, that moves in time with the discharge. For the, the, the first uh, result, in fact, shows us a very long-term uh, 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 changes in, in longitudinal profile, uh, going from the very far upstream in the Bovarain until the downstream of the Waal, we see the upstream degradation, as we said, and we see a small downstream uh, 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 bed level increase or aggradation, so in fact the river slope is changing, and this is uh, also matches very well the experience and the knowledge about the, the river behavior. The second part of the result is what we call a 2D long-term behavior. Uh, in this uh, picture, the red represents deposition, the blue represents erosion, and we see how the bifurcation is behaving and is it stable or not, and we see the, the erosion wave coming from upstream migrating in the downstream direction, and we see the, the, the let's say, the power pool pattern also changes with, with time. And this is, in fact, one of the most important type of results of the model, which we call the 2D local result. In fact, this is what defines dredging activities and what defines whether a measure has a large impact or a small impact. So here we show the depth of uh, 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 the, 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 the river at a certain discharge, and here the black lines, so the uh, there are three of them that represent the center line of the navigation channel and the boundaries of the navigation channel, and the red color represents any color that is uh, below the threshold. So if you are two and a half meter or below, in fact, uh, has to be dredged. So any color, which any red color which goes through the black line has to be dredged. And in fact, this is one of the most important results of the model. So in fact, as you see, the model is capable of also producing the 2D uh, uh, features in a proper way. Now we have been satisfied with the model, we have tested it, and it, we are happy with it. We move forward to apply this, this model in some case studies. And I'll take you through three applications. One of them, uh, 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 the Louis the, the, uh, Noodle dams, I will describe it in, in a second, dredging and nourishment. For the first one, which is, in fact, motivated by the, um, the, the wish to add more conveyance to the rivers to lower the flood level. And the question, of course, in, in a heavily navigable river, river like the Rhine, if you want to lower the flood, river, uh, the flood level, how, how do you harm the navigation? And if you, for example, remove the groins, in fact, effectively, you are increasing the width of the channel, which would add to a shallower channel, and this would not, very, uh, uh, would not land well with navigation or the ship owners. So in this case, uh, uh, the, the removal of the groin is combined with adding a longitudinal dam, to separate uh, uh, the main channel or the navigation channel from the growing fields. In this picture, it's, it's, uh, in fact, it has been implemented in reality, in fact, a year or so ago, and uh, uh, this allows flow on the two sides of the uh, longitudinal dam during high flow, but during low flow, it is limited only to the main channel. So you get, the, the let's say, the best of the two worlds. And we do, uh, we are able to implement this in the model, and we would like perhaps to show some results like this. So uh, this shows the uh, erosion in blue, in blue, the deposition in red, and you can also see some localized features, and it migrates in the downstream direction, and we are able to do this for a very long period. Uh, coming back to 
uh, the, the, the conclusions that we were able to draw from this. So we have uh, localized effects of these uh, uh, longitudinal dams and it needed some optimization at the inflow and outflow boundary or, or locations of the, the longitudinal dam. And we realized that our model with this type of resolution perhaps is not the most uh, effective tool to analyze such a local feature. So we recommended some additional analysis based on either a higher resolution model or a different tool. The second case I would like to share with you is uh, evaluating uh, 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 changing the, the, the navigation channel dimensions. So in fact we, we started with a channel of 150 times 200 feet, two and, two and a half meters, so 150 meter wide, two and a half meter deep, and this is the minimum requirement during the low flow. And what would happen if you increase the width, the width of the channel from 150 to 170? And the second case is what would happen if you increase the width of the, sorry, the depth of the channel from 250 to 2.8 meters? And this is a typical uh, result. So uh, if you look at a time series that look at one point uh, uh, that you know that it will be dredged, you will get a result that 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 looks like. Uh, the, the, the bed level is building up and then suddenly it is lowered to, uh, to the desired depth plus the threshold. So this is the threshold. It is lowered to the desired depth and then it starts building up again and then dredging kicks in again. And now uh, after doing this for these uh, three cases where we were able to evaluate how, do, how does this also uh, migrate in the downstream uh, uh, direction and how does uh, uh, it affect the, the downstream locations uh, 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 as a consequence of, of dredging. So it's not simply what, uh, migrating in the downstream but it also adjusts in the cross-sectional profile. So what we did with dredging is we dredged the shallow parts, dumped it in the deep parts, so we changed the slopes and this so have an effect uh, on how does it uh, 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 behave after the dredging operation and how a second dredging operation is being triggered. And in a rough comparison that is, that is useful for river managers to, in fact, e e quickly evaluate. So if we have at the current situation what we call a reference situation, a one bucket of sand being dredged, this bucket of sand increases to become 16 buckets if you increase the width and increases only to seven buckets if you increase the depth. Perhaps it's a bit surprising, but it's, it's, it is really not. And when you increase the width, you go more into your shallow parts, the, 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 the bars, uh, uh, and then it contributes very heavily to the dredging. So increasing the width of a channel would have a more impact on dredging volume than increasing the depth of the channel. Uh, nourishment, in fact, is if, if you recall a few uh, slides ago, I was explaining the upstream degradation and how does this does this propagate in the downstream direction? So in order to stop this upstream degradation, uh, 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 nourishment is planned in the, uh, in the, in the, in the bovarine, so the upstream part of the river. We add material in order to, st to stabilize the bed. Key parameters here are the quantity, the location, and the composition of the mixture. And of course, we needed to do modeling to optimize this operation. So how often should we uh, 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 repeat it was an important question. I will come to the answer of it at the end of this uh, section. And in fact, what you try to do with the, 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 the nourishment is to stop this degradation by leveling off the transport gradient. So there is uh, a gradient that causes erosion. You compensate for this by adding sediment. And you increase the efficiency if you dump coarser material, for example. And this is uh, uh, the planned operation in a nutshell, so 6,000 uh, tons per week to a total of 150 meter cubes or with a, a, a 30 centimeters uh, a thick layer, so uh, not very thick. And it is dumped in two locations and here we see the, the bed level changes after this uh, uh, nourishment operation. And you see it's migrating in the downstream direction, it is spreading on the width. And one of the questions was, how does this behave? How does this propagate? How far does it go in a year? And 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 do we need to repeat it every year or every two years? And in this case, we also wanted to know how does the material itself. So in fact, here it was a, a bed level changes, but in this slide, it is the 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 nourishment material itself. So how is the tracer or the fractions moving in the in the uh, downstream direction, and here you would see them also moving on on 
uh, on the surface and uh, migrating in the downstream direction. I have to say in this simulation we use the graded sediment model, which I did not discuss in this presentation, but it is very important to, to, to know that this study was done with the graded sediment part, which perhaps in a different webinar we covered that. And an interesting question, of course, is how fast does the, the fine material move compared to the coarser material? And the two, the, the, this shows a comparison. The top, the top uh, uh, animation shows the fine material, and the lower one shows the coarse material. You can see that it is way slower uh, uh, in the lower panel. And here, this shows three fractions in a cross-sectional, on a vertical section. So you see here the bed layers, in fact. And the flow, in this case, is from left to right, uh, opposite to the flow direction in the river. This is the fine material on top. And the bottom one is the coarsest material. You see it's pretty stable, uh, and it doesn't move much. And after this, we, we tested a final uh, case with uh, a repeated feeding every year. So we, we came to the conclusion that perhaps it needs to be repeated every year. And here you see uh, 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 a repetition every uh, year. So you see a, a, a continuous, uh, 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 let's say, a continuous feeding of sediment in the upstream. And that's how it is not really fading out of the model. So in fact, based on this, we were, we were able to, let's say, conclude that we have a very uh, uh, good morphological model of the rhyme branches. It is well calibrated both for hydrodynamics, for, hydro for morphology, both one-dimensional and two-dimensional. The model can be considered unique because, yeah, it is large scale, yet detailed to a level of, of, of a local bend. Uh, it has a refined dredging and dumping uh, functionalities. We are able to simulate different type of measures. It is relatively fast, so we can, we can run 40 years in uh, uh, roughly uh, four days, and it can be used effectively to evaluate measures, gives advice to the uh, to the managers. And now the model, in fact, has been disseminated to uh, all interested consultants in, in the Netherlands to use it in different projects. And now we are uh, 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 also has extended the functionalities by adding the, 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 the graded sediment, which I did not discuss today. After this, in fact, we're looking now to the future. So the, uh, uh, we, we aim now to migrate to the, uh, to the flexible mesh. And the blue uh, color is showing the first grids that we, we implemented, the gray in the background. It might not be visible, but I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry for that. But it, sh it shows that we can gain a lot of flexibility if we use the flexible mesh. We try to stick to the. Uh, let's say, structured features. So, so we use uh, uh, rectilinear uh, uh, grid cells. This is more, let's say, accurate in terms of uh, numerical solution. But we can also use triangles. Uh, we, we, we can use uh, hexagons. We can use anything. So here, we limit ourselves to uh, uh, rectangles and, and, and triangles in this, in this case. But you can see that you can very easily improve your grid, improve the, the, the coverage in the floodplain. This is a case where we show uh, a secondary channel being well uh, implemented in, in, in the grid, whereas in the structured case, it's not, it's not uh, well represented. And this is a picture from, let's say, uh, how it looks in the new user interface. So this is, in fact, looking a bit more to the future. Uh, we plan to start the, uh, the, uh, the migration and the testing and the calibration uh, uh, next year. So early next year, we will start with this migration. And this brings me to uh, uh, the, the slide before the last, where this is the early results of the, 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 the flexible mesh model results. It shows part of the river wow with uh, flow uh, from right to left as, 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 um, as it, it does. And then the color represents vorticity. And you can see the effect of the groins. This is using uh, a standard Smagorinsky turbulence model to solve these turbulence, turbulence structures. And here, it is, in fact, the end of my presentation. I would like to invite you to attend maybe the Software Days, which is in uh, a couple of weeks. And there is a dedicated course to modeling rivers using uh, a flexible mesh. Thank you. Mohamed, uh, thank you for your very uh, detailed presentation. And during your presentation, we have received many questions via the chat box. And all these questions have been answered by our colleague Bert Jagers in an excellent way. Thank you, Bert. But, but 